Welcome to Deep Dive Video 2 on the Zox Nasha Synthesizer. In the second video, we'll take a look into Raspberry Pi Gadget Mode. We'll be setting up the Raspberry Pi for MIDI and a massive number of audio channels. This is some really cool stuff you can do with the Raspberry Pi, not something I've seen well documented elsewhere. In this video, we'll be inspecting Gadget Mode. No, not that gadget. First off, what is Gadget Mode? Gadget Mode enables the Pi to operate as a USB device. One would plug the Raspberry Pi into a host computer, and the host computer sees the Pi as that device. You might use Gadget Mode to make the Pi appear as an Ethernet device, mass storage, or other different devices. We're going beyond obnoxious with this device. To a host computer, this Raspberry Pi will appear as two audio devices and a MIDI device. That is our gadget. Since there are quite a few tutorials on setting up a Raspberry Pi in Gadget Mode, I'll go over the basics pretty quick. I assume you've got a Raspberry Pi and have Linux installed. I'm not going to go into detail on the boot config files, other than to say you want dt overlay equals dwc2 in the Pi's config.txt configuration file. That enables the gadget stuff we'll be using. The example here is for my GitHub project. Now, let's set up gadget mode for MIDI over USB, and set it up for multiple audio interfaces over USB. Why MIDI and audio? Did you even watch my previous video? MIDI can be used to send all sorts of messages to another MIDI device. Then use the audio interfaces to send PCM streams, basically raw samples that represent a signal level. You could use the PCM for control voltages or other signals. MIDI and audio are commonly supported by music software suites, so that's another good reason to pick these as gadgets for the Pi. Okay, technical detail. I haven't talked about libcomposite. We need to pull in libcomposite. Without that, one can set up a single audio interface or a single MIDI interface. That's cool, but not both interfaces. Not cool, and definitely not beyond obnoxious. Starting with libcomposite enables a composite gadget, capable of instantiating more than one function. Right, two audio interfaces plus MIDI. And here's a sidetrack. That's why I chose using the Raspberry Pi for the Zox Nauseous project. There are really good arguments for using an Arduino, STM32, or some other bare metal controller without an operating system. But the operating system is exactly what we're leveraging here. Linux provides flexibility of module configuration. It's pretty simple to change up the number of audio channels, the sampling rate, the bit depth. It's all configurable. Back to the task at hand, let's take a look at how the USB gadgets are configured. I have a script for this, shown here. The top of this create USB gadget script to find some parameters we'll use for the gadgets. Lots of important stuff can be defined here like sampling rate and number of audio channels. Sampling rate can take a single value or a list of sampling rates. I chose just a single value, 4 kHz, the lowest sampling rate supported, enough for my use case of synthesizer control voltages. And I didn't find the need to support multiple sampling rates. The channel mask tells the library which audio channels are active. Set bits to 1 for channels to be active. So for two channels, the value is three. For eight channels, it'd be 255. In maxing it out, I found 27 channels to be the greatest number allowed by the driver. So that gives a value of 134,217,727. And why 27 channels for a maximum? That's such an odd number. A November 2020 email on the Linux kernel provides some insights on this. Something about the USB audio spec reserving four channels and the high bit having a special value. So that's five channels that can't be used. So 32 minus five gives 27, which is what we've got here. There's also a comment in the email towards adding more channels by adding more audio clusters. I'm not even sure what that means to add more clusters and what operating systems would support that. So we stick to 27 audio channels per interface. I'm looking forward to comments detailing this out if anybody has more info. If this could go beyond 27 channels, that'd be really great. Recall earlier I did say we'd set up two audio interfaces, not one. Two interfaces would then provide 27 times 2, or 54 channels of audio. Going back to the example script, I have been able to stand up two audio interfaces as shown. And here's where I could use another hand. Similar to the 27 channel limit, I don't know if two audio interfaces is a hard limit, or what prevents additional interfaces from being created. I've tried three or four and it just doesn't work. I'm curious if more than two is possible and what magic sauce might enable that. 
Drop a line in the comments if you have info on why you can't instantiate more than two audio interfaces, or if there's a trick to doing so. Moving on to MIDI, the interface is pretty simple compared to the audio interface. The lines shown here in the script are all that's required. I've not tried setting up multiple MIDI devices, as I've not had a use case for that. Now that we've configured the interfaces, let's show that they actually work. To do that, we'll loop inputs back to outputs. By looping back, I mean anything appearing on the Pi's MIDI in will be sent back to MIDI out. Similar with the audio. Any audio stream sent to the Pi will be sent back to the USB host computer. To set up a loop, all we need is our Pi gadget connected to a host computer by USB. Then run a couple commands on the Raspberry Pi. For MIDI, the Linux command is A connect. Using that, we'll mirror MIDI in to MIDI out. For each audio interface, we'll run an instance of also loop to specify the input and output ports. Any audio on the input channel is echoed back to the output channel. To show this working, let's check it out in VCV Rack. The Pi is plugged in via USB to make its audio and MIDI devices available to the host computer running VCV Rack. Then the Rack host is pointed to the gadget devices. Now the fun part. Send a signal from the host computer running Rack to each device channel on the Pi via audio or MIDI. Then monitor the return in VC Rack with a scope. I've set up an LFO and a random source to output to all the audio channels and output as MIDI on a number of continuous controllers. That goes out to the Pi and gets looped back. We can see the return data follows the input. Let's look at the source signal in Rack, the return from the MIDI, and the return from the audio interface. The top trace is the source LFO signal. The middle yellow trace is a single MIDI return, and the bottom green trace is the return of a single audio channel. They don't line up exactly. This would be because it takes some time to go from VC rack to the Pi and back, and the time is different depending upon the interface. What the scope shows is the round trip latency of the interfaces. The audio interface looks poor in this light about 120 milliseconds round trip versus MIDI at about 38 milliseconds. But that's also because the audio interface is using a pretty large buffer, probably larger than what's necessary. You can play around with reducing the buffers on the host and on the Raspberry Pi to decrease latency. Before we convince ourselves that MIDI is better due to latency alone, let's take a closer look at the returned MIDI stream. We can already see the MIDI data is stair-stepping due to its 7-bit interface. Now up the LFO frequency a bit. Once the LFO frequency increases, the MIDI return channel starts to show a lot of artifacts and aliasing. VC Rack is sending MIDI using 7-bit continuous controllers at 200 Hz. Meanwhile, the audio interface at 16-bit, 4 kHz, looks just fine. So what you're seeing is what you'd expect from each interface. So for any data that may require a frequency of more than around 100 Hz, I'd recommend the audio interface. Use the MIDI interface for non-signal data, such as command messages at a low frequency. Hey, I think I covered that in my previous deep dive video. This puts some concrete reasoning behind it. VCV rack aside, what I'd really like to hear about is what interesting projects you can come up with using this many audio channels and other gadgets such as MIDI. In a sense, it's a solution looking for a problem. So here's the problem it solves for the Zox Nauseous synthesizer. I'm not going to do any sort of code walkthrough as that'd be just boring. What I will show is how these interfaces are used in the Zox Noxus synthesizer. Take this as prep for the next video, which will dive into the hardware. In the previous deep dive video, I talked about different uses for audio and MIDI in the Zox Noxus synthesizer. Audio is used for control voltages and MIDI for command messaging. These show up on the interfaces we just set up. The core synthesizer code spawns threads for each type of interface. Shown here are the USB interfaces, the core synthesizer daemon, threads spawned for each interface, voice card drivers, and hardware interfaces. There's a MIDI handler thread and an audio handler thread. The two stay out of each other's hair as much as possible. So far I've not gone full geek on the hardware interfaces. I do have a lot to say about it, but yeah, I'm saving for that for the next video. I will say the voice cards use two different hardware interfaces, one called SPI and one called I2C. Without giving any further hardware details, the voice card drivers take the audio and MIDI and use that to drive both SPI and I2C. Specifically, the audio stream used to drive the SPI peripherals in the hardware, 
and the MIDI messages drive the I2C interface. The big thing here is that by design, each front-end interface, audio and MIDI, only talks to one back-end interface, SPI and I2C. And here's where it's important. Each thread can run independent from the other. The audio slash spy pipeline is independent from the MIDI slash I2C pipeline. And that's how the Raspberry Pi is configured in gadget mode for the Zox Nautilus synthesizer, and why a Raspberry Pi is used. With these first two deep dive videos, I've shown the host VCV rack messaging, the Pi's interfaces, and introduce the backend hardware device interfaces. The next video will cover the Zox Nautilus signal bus and really get into the hardware layer. If there's something specific you'd like to see, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.